Okay. Is everybody settled in? So this is the Working Group Chairs Forum. Uh, the uh, the uh, pink half of the Working Group Chairs Forum team at the top just realized that I forgot to upload the chair slides. So, uh, the, <laughs> um, so we're going to start with um, go down to the note well. This this is an IETF meeting. This is the note well. Uh, so uh, anything, all of the standard rules of the note well apply. You all are working group chairs or leadership of some, for, some form or another, so I'm sure you understand the note well. Uh, the next thing is administrative, so the agenda. No, 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 not, not the ATV agenda. <laughs> <laughs> this agenda. <laughs> so this is the agenda for the working group chair forum for today. Um, is there any agenda bashing? Okay. Um, with that, uh, Heather, are you ready? There you are. And then. Here's the thing. Okay. I'm, I'm going to miss you guys. <laughs> but, but hey, guess what? Um, Do we need to turn the mic? Hello, microphone. Uh, how's that? OK. Um, you all may have heard that I'm working on changing the RFC format. Is this a surprise to anybody in this room? You're lying. OK. So uh, as a reminder, primary goals, XML is the under uh, unchanging uh, underlying format means you don't edit the document once it's published. It doesn't mean that the vocabulary doesn't ever change ever again. Um, the outputs will be text, PDF A3, which is an archival target, and HTML. There will be SVG. No, there won't be color because color is stinking hard. Um, and non-ASCII characters uh, will be allowed. All of this has been described uh, in sort of the, the first rendition of a set of requirements documents from like RFC 7991 to 7998 or something like that. Um, we know that what's in those documents uh, may not su survive reality. So there will be biz documents for all of them. Um, I would love to get those done before the end of the year. We'll see how that goes. Um, now, several moving parts need to align, but the RFC Production Center is uh, working very hard to make sure that they are ready by the end of August of this year <clears throat> um, to be published V3 documents. Uh, there's, there's still a little bit of question, will the tools be quite ready? Um, and of course, the end-to-end -end process. At this point, you can submit V3 XML into the data tracker, and you know how many of them there are? 11. Um, I think that's right, 11. It's a small number. Um, now, that said, we are also going to be converting V2 to V3. We're going to be able to do all of these things. Um, but the you all have to be ready for it. The IESG has to be ready for it. The RPC has to be ready for it. So end to end, I, I still think we can get by the end of August. We'll see how it goes. Um, Expect several months of deb debugging. Expect documents to take longer to get published um, because the RFC editor is going to be spending a lot of quality time staring at this. And we expect you all to be spending some quality time staring at the various outputs as well. Uh, there are a couple of URLs up there. Um, one is sort of the, the just the high level checklist of what things do we need to do and when do we expect to have them done by for implementing from the RFC editor's perspective. And another thing, and this is the way, if you get nothing else out of me talking to you today, the FAQ, XML to RFC V3 HTML, go there, bookmark it, make sure your folks have seen it because it's going to answer a lot of questions about how do I do or, or what, what does this mean or so on and so forth. And that will be, a, not, not to get into any other discussions, it will be a living document, the way living documents are intended. Um, 
So as we get more questions, we will be updating this, but that's, that's probably one of the best resources we're putting out right now to help people know what to do. Um, in that FAQ, some of the highlights, basics, how to create a draft, using references, because um, guess what, the RC editor, we really care about those references. Um, use How to use lists, some finer points about C data, special characters, and um, just new in V3, how do I do the following? Big list of stuff. Um, right now, the RPC is actively training, uh, converting V2 files to V3 files, asking people for input on that. Um, the files are being reviewed by tools developers and by volunteers on the XML to RFC dev list. Um, the RPC will be sharing files with uh, authors that they've said, you know, you seem um, friendly and willing to work with us, so please help us review these things. They won't get published as V3, but, but help us kick the tires on what the process we think will look like. Um, so if you, you may hear from Sandy and Allison crew as they, they ask for specific help. Um, a little more just additional information. What are we going to expect in Auth48? Because um, when we get to the point where we're ready to say we are switching over, uh, what's in the Auth48 queue as v2 will be converted to v3 files. Um, the RPC will do that. Uh, the authors uh, that had perhaps already approved their document, you know, maybe two out of three authors have approved. It's not through Auth48 yet with all the approvals. They're going to ask, be asked to review it again and re redo their approvals to make sure that we've got this right. Um, and then, as I mentioned, we're, we're aiming to be ready to get this done by the 28th of August. Um, the one other point I threw in here, uh, so as I mentioned, this is going to mean documents take longer to get published. There's three... Uh, where we used to be looking at the text format, now we're looking at, okay, but is the HTML right? Is the text right? Is the PDF right? Is the new XML right? Um, so there's definitely gonna be more work there. And because the gods are very unkind, Cluster 238 is gonna release about the same time. Um, so we're absolutely expecting to miss the service level agreement. Um, we are uh, working on getting, what does that mean, documented, working with the uh, LLC board, as the con sort of the holders of the contract to make sure that the contract's exceptions are discussed and if they are granted, that the it's granted with limits and documented, et cetera. And I think that was it from me. Heather. Jim. Can you hear me? Almost. Kind of. You can always try the one closer. I can relay your question to the room. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, That's better. All right. Do we know yet when we're going to be able to put V3 documents with things like SVG on the data tracker and actually see them that way? That's a really good question. I don't know. This is Murray. Um, you said you're going to be staring at this. Other parties will be staring at this. We as working group chairs have an opportunity to stare at this as well. What would you like us to look for? Anything in particular? Um, I think one of the key things would be looking at the output. Is the output what you expect to see? Um, there's, there's new ways to do things like lists and tables. Do those things look right. like you would expect them to look? Other questions, comments? I'm, gonna, I'm looking at Sandy and Alice in the back. Did I did I lie at any point? Am I good? I've All right. Been Kata. So I know in the past you've talked about having us try to look at the actual XML sources because that's the authoritative copy. Yes. Um, but then we're going to have you know the new generated HTML. Mm -hmm. Does it make sense to also look at the raw HTML as opposed to loading it up in a browser or other rendering environment? Um, if, you, if you'd like bonus points and gold stars, sure. Uh, but at, that was never in my head for y'all to have to do. Um, 
at least from my perspective, and perhaps it's a bit naive, um, with the HTML, uh, it's what you see that's going to be particularly important with that because the it's the XML that's that's like the normative language and being transformed and everything. So, any other questions for me? Okay, thank you very much. Um, I believe the agenda next. Just put the agenda back up. Okay, um, Ombuds team. Uh, was it Melinda or Pete? Oh, Barry. Oh, Barry's going to go first. Okay. Yeah, this will be very quick. Um, I, I spoke with y'all. IUTF 104. I'm trying to remember which number is which. Um, and I wanted to just give a quick follow up on that about um, behavior of uh, behavior in your working groups and our request to you to help us um, make it better. So the message we want to give you is that the, the, the message we want to give the community is that the IATF community as a whole does not accept insulting, abusive, unprofessional behavior, that sort of thing. And we expect to be treated respectfully even during strong disagreement. We would like you as working group chairs to help the IESG get that message to the community. Um, be more alert to that kind of behavior. Be more quick to react to it and more firm in reacting to it. Phase it out. Uh, if it happens on the mailing list, start with a private conversation. Move to a public conversation if that's necessary. But it's also important to make sure that the community knows that something's being done and that this behavior is not part of what the community, not something the community accepts. Um, so we're behind you. We will help you with it. We'd like you to be very active in uh, in pushing this down to the community. And if needed, we, we are looking at ways to get some resources for techniques to help you and that sort of thing. Um, so this isn't the last word you're going to hear from the IESG about it, but now you're going to hear some stuff from the Ombuds team. Coerced into doing that? What's that? Were you coerced into doing that? Coerced, but not coerced into doing that. So uh, Melinda said that she will put her two cents in as we go along here. So uh, I expect many of you are aware that some of the um, IETF main list discussion has generated heat in addition to light. And some of that heat is a little hot. Uh, so we've been talking for some time about what you all can do to help. We, uh, the Ombuds team and some folks from the IESG had a meeting on Wednesday, no, Monday, Monday, Monday lunch, thank you. It's such a long week. The other Wednesday. Um, with uh, some folks and we're looking to bring in other resources, professional resources, to sort of help with this. We understand that none of us in leadership and none of you as chairs in general have been hired on the basis of your wonderful and incredible HR management abilities. <laughs> we are all in the same boat. We learn as we go. Some of us have more experience, some less. But we want to start to give you some ideas, some hints about how to go forward and how to manage your groups that will help this along. And as you have questions, bring them up. And you can do that on the working group chairs list. You can do that directly to the ombuds team if it's touchier. Uh, you can certainly do that with your ADs. And your ADs are learning along with you. Do not feel like you're cut off in space here as the poor little person who doesn't know. So Barry mentioned this business about on list, off list kinds of things. There are techniques that you can use that will help this along. The main problem that I've seen so far is a lot of inconsistency, which is people start acting a little rambunctious, and it gets let go, and then it gets let go a little further, and then chair whoever 
panic sets in. Oh my God, I have to do something about this. This has gotten out of hand. And then the actions start to look arbitrary. Uh, so you want to start those conversations as someone is getting a little heated, maybe off list, drop a note, say, uh, let's just make sure to keep this in check. And one of the nice things you can do is get that person on board with you. We want to show other folks in the group, especially the new folks, that this is not the way to go. It would be ever so nice if you, a uh, person who did this little offense, would post and say, you know what, I got a little heated there, sorry about that, let's try that again without as much rambunctiousness. You can do that. It's also very important to do the same kinds of things in your working group sessions. We consistently see chairs who sit up at the table and are not paying attention to what's going on at the mics. It's, well, they're having a conversation, I'll let it go until it gets out of control. And generally speaking, you have a second chair. You can whisper to your second chair, could you go whisper in that person's ear? Maybe next time they get to the mic, they should calm it down a bit. You need to do active management in the room. You need to do active management on the list. And it's hard. Um, and like I said, we're going to try and come up with more ideas, tools. Um, Marie-Jose Montpetit, co-chair of the Network Coding Research Group, where we had a major uh, problem of violence that was actually directed at the chairs and the participants. We tried to take it offline. We tried to get it off list. We tried to get it off our persons. Um, the problem is the lists are not the only ways that people use to get to us. There is also the LinkedIn. There's Facebook. There's all kinds of other ways that this, the person who has the bad behavior may use all kinds of other things. I have absolutely to thank the people in the IETF who actually helped us because at one point there was threats of violence and the Boston police was involved. And I agree that there is a lot of things that you should do, but I think we're basically uh, nonviolent people. And when people start having bad behavior, we let it go because we do not want to confront the person. And I don't know if there are ways to do that. In our case, it really got bad. And it's actually the funny thing that you know, when we were in the middle of it, which was last year, uh, we were told that it was not the first time, which I found was amazing because I thought we were so, you know, out of it. Um, but I would say I agree with all with what you said, but I think I don't know how that can be done. But sometimes within the group, you will not have the resources because we're involved. We know the person. In our case, we knew the person from other activities. I think I don't know if there's a way to have some kind of link in between the groups when you start having someone who is completely out of it. Uh, but for us, we tried everything you said. We confronted the person. We confronted the person personally. We confronted the person via Skype. We confronted the person. And actually, every time, it was getting worse. So I, I, I so think it's this a... Is, this is my comment. I think everything you said... I think works well if you think that people are fairly rational. Right. In our case, we were dealing with somebody who was completely irrational. And, and, and I, I think this scared. is a, a, an excellent point and something that we should all keep in mind. Um, there is no time at which it's too early to escalate. Okay. Right? That, you know, the ADs are there. We are, we as the Ombuds team are here. Um, and there, escalating too quickly can't happen right someone someone does something and it gets to us and we say you know what not time to escalate yet no big deal with that but yeah having the ability to have the community certainly asking questions of other chairs on the working group chairs list is fine but that one sounds like and eventually you got to you just had to escalate all the way up um and i think no one should be worried about doing that. No one should feel like they have to do any of this on their own. That's, that, that's the worst possible outcome. We do need to act as a community. So yeah, I, I, I don't want to minimize exactly what you were talking about by saying there are all these little tools. That's for the general case. 
And we all know that we, I mean, we have hit multiple of those cases. And although physical violence is really rare to be threatened, but thankfully, but yeah, it has to be dealt with quickly. Jeff has. Uh, so I want to share some experience from other mailing list contexts that I've done. Uh, it moderated other lists in various forms with the people that are very hot headed on very hot topics. And <clears throat> it's been my experience that uh, when things have started, you know, heating up past a certain point, the feedback cycle of it being semi real time is what tends to cause things to go a little bit crazy. You know, everybody that is running a mailing list, and any of you their chairs have, you know, log in for mailman to be able to, you know, manage your mail list, have minimally a tool on there that's called emergency moderation. You can click this button and every bit of mail to the list just stops. You, you can at that point control which ones actually go through. And if necessary, you can selectively moderate people. This is not saying your job is to censor the people, but just simply by introducing that delay in the responses, things sometimes can get better on their own. Uh, Suresh mentioned directly that he ha did this as a chair with one working group. And the effective tool for him was he turned on moderation completely and then went to the individuals and said, I'm moderating this. Do you really want me to post this as is? And he said he got a pretty good response of a lot of people saying, no, that's okay. Um, and this is the thing. I, I, I mean, I think most of the participants are rational and will respond well. And some of them will continue to be hot headed and will need to deal with them in a different way. But yeah, I, moderating the list, you are completely empowered to do. One of the other things you should note that you are completely empowered to do is during a working group session, refuse the mic to someone. If someone is getting out of control, you can have them sit down and say, that's it. You're not getting up to the mic again. And that's in 2418. You can refuse them the floor. Perfectly reasonable if they're getting out of control. Uh, ben Kadek, I was also talking to Suresh. And just to point out that the, the caveat to that is that uh, it only stops traffic to the list. So if a message is sent to the list and the other person they're being hot-headed with, the individual, the single copy still goes to the other individual. Uh, and so just be aware of that. You know, Yes, this is a very effective tool, but there is a caveat. Right, and mentioning to the person who got CC'd, uh, by the way, the, it didn't make it to the list, so perhaps responding is not the best plan. Uh, yeah. And this is Barry, just pointing out, you can also moderate individuals as well as doing the emergency moderation of the whole list. So when Melinda and I were talking, we thought this would be sort of free form. Do you have any questions of approaches? Do you want to talk about particular instances Name names, don't name names, uh, whatever you like, but we are being recorded and we are being, you know, we are being meat echoed and all that stuff. Yeah, one thing I want to highlight um, is that it's okay for people to be angry and it's okay for them to express that anger. That doesn't need to be stopped. It's when they're abusive and hostile and um, <laughs> causing other people to be abusive and hostile because we know that participants do model other participants' behavior, um, that there needs to be an intervention. So it's not the anger. And I, you know, I think that a lot of people here are actually capable and do frequently express anger in a very straightforward way, and that's, that's good. So one point of clarification. John Scudder. Um, so, so you mentioned that you can r refuse somebody the floor and um, and not necessarily looking for an answer to this or anything, but I just want to point out that it's it, it's all very well to say that, you know, we have the formal authority to do that, but um, probably most of us, certainly I have encountered more than once the case where somebody's filibustering and won't sit down and, you know, sometimes it you know, it turns into a shouting match between the chair and the person who's filibustering. Um, so, I, I wonder if it might um, help to have a mic cut button, although, you know, it's, it's tempting to always have a technological solution to a, a, a human problem. So uh, I, an earlier conversation reminded me of this. Um, you should have, con if you are finding contentious meetings, right, that you're running contentious meetings, 
you should have the conversation with your AD up front, right? You are empowered to do that, but you need absolute unequivocal backup from your AD to pull that off. So when you say, John, sit down, you're done at the mic, and the person keeps going and you say it the second time, by the third time your AD should be standing up and going, this is John's call, he is chairing this meeting, you need to sit down now. And if that person is, you know, sufficiently disruptive, um, well, yeah. You know, there is the point where someone becomes so recalcitrant that outside means need to be taken. Hopefully we never get there. And the meeting venues have security staff. But, but I, I mean, and, and this is again, you know, to Marie's point, yeah, people go over the top and, and, and we have to deal with that with security staff, with police, with whatever. For the most part, luckily, that's not gonna be the case. Um, and, and the comment can be, you need to sit down until you know, you're not being abusive anymore and we can talk after the meeting about this or whatever. And also try and keep your cool about it because it gets harder and harder the more amped up you get. So, With respect to moderating specific users, I understand that we can do the emergency moderation thing. Um, we have somewhere in the RFC 2000 numbers is here's a process by which you can suspend somebody's privileges on a list. Did that change recently? Yeah. So what's the difference between that process and what you just described where you can actually flag, I'm going to moderate that person. Moderating the whole list is probably something you can get away with in a crisis, but if moderating one person, we have a process for that that takes steps to get to. So what's different? Oh, no, 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 no. The, the steps for moderating one person, mm -hmm. well, moderating is not a problem at all because that person's posts are still being made. Now, you want to cut that person off and say you are not posting anymore. Don't care what oh, that's you That's the distinction, okay. Then you have to start the process, but that process for the chair to do for 30 days is actually relatively simple. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah. There's notifications and but that's it. I, I'm wondering it's, if it's like, I don't know, appealable that I cut you off because you're disrupting a conversation, and uh, but I didn't run through that process. So Not not for the instant moderation. I'm, I'm going to put you in the queue, and I will look at the post before it goes. No, okay. that, that's not a problem. Hi, uh, Colin Perkins. Just on the, the meeting uh, management, I, I've seen uh, working groups that have paused the meeting and taken a 10-minute break halfway. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. sorry uh, on the meeting management, I've seen working groups take a pause and uh, take a 10-minute break in the middle to let things calm down, which is sometimes a good approach. All right, thank you very much. Since there's nobody in the queue, we will move on. Thank you, guys. <laughs> um, so next, uh, you will all have seen uh, a question Michelle posed to the mailing list, and she's going to come and gather some real-time feedback on... Or not. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> now for something much more fun. Define, define fun. Um, Is it working? Yes? Um, I'm Michelle Cotton. I'm with IANA. Um, and yes, I did post a question to the list. Um, we did get a suggestion about having a maybe a short little video directed at a working group chair on uh, helpful hints for how to do um, something related to IANA considerations. And and it got us thinking a little bit more. We wanted to open up the discussion to you all and uh, not necessarily get the feedback today, but at least get you thinking um, as you review documents in your working group, especially new ones coming in, is there any type of resource, um, any type of material, uh, maybe it is a short little video, maybe it's something else that would help you. Either you and your in your position as working group chair or something you can say to one of your authors, uh, go watch this, go look at this. We do have RFC 8126. It is a beast. Um, maybe it's dissecting some of that into some more useful material, um, breaking it down into little pieces. Um, one thing that um, we we do that we're trying to actually have done earlier in the process is when we get last call announcements, 
that is often the first time we're looking at documents. And in those documents, there could be a request for some parameters in an expert review registry. And so at that time, we initiate the expert review. And sometimes it's uh, a little bit late. Sometimes maybe there's no expert for that registry. And so it takes time to get the expert assigned and then get the request to them. Sometimes the experts can take a little <laughs> while. So we've been trying to figure out how we can try to move that little bit of review earlier into the process. If you have any, any ideas on that, we would love to hear them. Um, also, um, many of you deal with um, requesting early allocation of code points. Um, for the most part, that's been working well, but if you still have questions about that or there's something we can do better, again, we would like that feedback. Uh, just look at my notes here. I think that's mostly it. Uh, Barry and I are working on an update to 8126. Um, to add in uh, a few things and fix uh, a couple areas in there. So if there's something that you feel like is violently missing from there, we would also like to hear that. So um, either in person here, or if you wanna go back and think about it and as you're working, please uh, send us email or to the working group chairs list. We're, um, we're just happy to listen so we can kind of focus our energy on getting something that's useful for you guys. Okay. Hi, Michelle. David Black. Wanted to sort of uh, follow up on a suggestion I made on the list, which is much as we um, respect and value the work of IANA, IANA considerations are often one of the last things the authors get to. So, what I was going to su suggest, and uh, there's a question coming in a minute here, was uh, in the same way that, that, that we have uh, templates for, uh, for draft write ups. Um, if there are common cases, are there common cases IANA sees where if the authors would just use this text every time, IANA wouldn't have to spend time parsing, par, par, parsing what the author what the author meant with this interesting choice of words? So, like templates. Yeah, like 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 like, tem like te te templates. I mean, the, the thinking is: look, if the author wants you, if the author wants you something clever with a brand new registry, go read eighty one twenty six and and stop complaining. However, if they just want to do something routine, just allocate a point. If you had a template, what so, might you might start seeing a template text coming back every time, and it's one glance. Okay, I okay, the I interview knows exactly what the author wanted, as opposed to oh, you left out the name of the registry, or wait a minute, you need to. So, if you have common cases where you're wasting time on simple stuff and you can provide some templates that are cut and paste, cut paste, fill in the blanks. That might have that, that that might speed things up for everybody. And I, I should mention that in RFC eighty one twenty six, there is a link to another document that actually has some template type style information. Uh, that document is fairly hidden on our website because we didn't have a really great place to put it. But it but Working it, group chairs wiki could be a good home for the relevant oh. content. Okay, yeah. we'll write that down in the. Suggestion box. So, yeah, so. <laughs> this, this is Barry. Let me ask uh, all of you: Are how many of you regularly use the working group chairs wiki for something? Uh, so, unfortunately, few, once and that's uh, regularly is once please, a year. yeah, please more. <laughs> yeah, Kasten, yeah, I just want to underscore what David said. What what actually happens is the, the author has uh, thirty minutes to submission deadline and tries to fill in the IANA considerations. <laughs> and typically what they do is they find an RFC that, that yeah. registers something similar and copy it over. No, <laughs> right. <laughs> right, which means they, they often propagate bad practices that yes. exist. Right? Um, so, Kirsten, <laughs> what deadline are you referring to? The internet draft submission deadline. And then it's okay. never touched again. Okay. Well, okay. Well, that's the problem, Maybe. right? Because we we see the document most often during ITF last call. Yes. And there's lots of time before that. Yes. Um, so ha having having just shipped another document, the INA considerations are coming back from the the AD. Um, I think it would be nice to to have a few samples, I'm not talking about templates, samples of, of IANA considerations that, that are good to copy. 
So if if a particular registry like yeah. media types, Don um, Donald's documents. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, had yeah. had a pointer to to registrations that that are good to copy, that would help most. Okay, thank you. So so Michelle, we talked about this. This is Dave Waltermeyer. We talked about this briefly earlier in the week. You know, I'm a programmer. I think about things in design patterns. You know, uh, a lot of the um, IANA registrations, you know, tend to follow some fairly common you know patterns. Um, it might be useful to organize templates in some some guidance around, you know, developing an IANA registry um, in, to follow certain common patterns, you know, things like this is a this is how you do a registry of registries. This is how you, you know, do a simple indexed registry, you know, that, that has a name and an index number, you know, you know, things that, that are, are sort of repeating concepts that exist in a lot of, a lot of drafts. Um, we might even be able to, you know, take a look at, you know, do a, do a brief survey and see where there's a lot of commonality across, you know, drafts and you know, try to develop a short list of, of design patterns to focus on first. Yeah, and in, in that document that I mentioned, that's linked from 8126, we do have some of those very frequently used samples. You know, often they're a number column a description column yeah. and a reference uh, or some some variation of that. So we, we can look at that more and, and see how we can present it in a yeah. better way. Yeah, and incidentally, I was looking at 8126 the other day and I couldn't find that. Uh, so you couldn't that find the, the example. It, there's a link in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anything we could do to make that more obvious would yeah. be helpful. Yeah, great, thank you. So this is Robert Sparks. I'm going to um, bring the conversation back to uh, uh, the point that you made about trying to push recognizing that expert review needs to happen and possibly initiating that expert review earlier in the process. I wonder if it would be possible to develop a culture in working groups, across working groups, where there is an expectation on authors to put in their IANA consideration section, even if they are pasting it in at the very last minute before the draft submission, an explicit statement about whether or not the registry they're touching needs expert review. So we train them, train the individual authors to learn how to know whether or not an expert review needs to happen so that they know how to put this sentence in. And it can, you know, we, we can, I don't want to dive too deep into the mechanics. The draft would need to have something where it didn't end up lying around in the RFC at the end. So it could be in, in the, you know, RFC editor, please remove this kind of kind of bracket. But we just set the expectation that when these drafts come in, when they're, you know, when, when they're submitted as working group drafts, anything, anytime it's touching a registry, there is a sentence in there that the, that the author populates saying this requires expert review or does not require expert review. So yeah, definitely a kind of a culture change there on what we expect um, authors to be doing. May uh, think a little bit about whether there's some type of resource we could provide that working group chairs could point authors to and say, hey, before you are asking me to do a final review, um, if your document touches any IANA stuff, go look at this or watch this or read this. Um, and Rob, that would be maybe one of those check marks on there. Robert, what, what would be the difference in what happens if the, the author does that? The author would learn ahead of time that there is a barrier to having my RSC published that, that you know he might not otherwise have learned until the thing was in the ISG's hand and the ISG member figured it out. The chair who might not have been paying attention might see this line in this thing, you know, during a draft submission and say, oh, well, I should queue that up and be watching for the point. Maybe I can kick this expert review off like right before working group last call or during working group last call. Or if it looks like it's something gnarly, I can get an, an, an early review. So to make sure that our group's not going completely into a place that we're going to have to crawl out of later. John Scudder. Um, so to, to, to the earlier comment that, um, 
you know, stuff gets pasted in 30 minutes before the, the deadline and then never touched again. Um, if it's never touched again, that means that the document shepherd is also kind of calling it in because there's like a specific thing in the document shepherd guidelines that says, you know, the document shepherd has reviewed the IANA section and, you know, thinks that it's not broken. Um, so, you know, number one, um, I guess, you know, for us, we should probably make sure that our document shepherds are actually reviewing those IANA sections. Um, I personally, when acting as document shepherd, have pretty much completely rewritten more than one of those, I'm afraid. Um, and, and I think something that would, you know, er, earlier you were talking about training materials, templates, um, where do we link those from, et cetera, and it might be productive to stick a link right there in the document shepherd template that says over here is where the templates are, just in case you need to rewrite somebody's IANA section. Um, Murray, I'm also a media type reviewer. Um, there are plenty of terrible examples of what you should submit, so please don't copy those. The problem is, of course, someone writing up a template doesn't know if what they're looking at is a bad example. Things change over time of what we're prepared to accept and what we're not. So anything we can do to arrange or to encourage authors to approach reviewers early and say designated experts for for the other DEs in the room, um, first, can you identify that who the reviewer should be? And secondly, will you please take an early look at this? Because if I can avoid a round trip with you, because our round trips sometimes take a while, um, you should try to avoid those. So, uh, yeah, I definitely encourage that. Any anything we can do to smooth that process out, we get a lot of crap and the my, and the mind types reviewers, and we have to do two or three round trips. So, yes, we 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 know. Yeah. Um, to, to add on what Murray said, we also offer early review at any point in time too. We don't have to wait till last call to review a document. So. If as working group chairs, you see a document and you're like, oh my gosh, this section is absolutely awful. Um, you know, you can also tell them, hey, go contact Diana and, and they're going to help you <laughs> to improve your section. Um, w w one thing I do notice at IETF meetings is that we are getting more authors coming to us at the table to say, this is what I want to do. How do I do it? And when their document goes through, there's a lot less pain because they've already done it the right way from the very beginning. So you can always um, tell them to contact us early and we can help too. Uh, Brian Rosen, <clears throat> two, two things. Um, by far the most common IANA action is add a, add a value to a registry. We could automate that, right? You know what the shape of the registry is, so you know what the values are. So you could put a, we could put something in XML or RFC, which is, at, at an add a value function that, you know, pull down what register you're doing and, you know, fill it all in. So, 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 so clearly there are registries for which that wouldn't work, but the, the, the 90% would, would help a lot. I, I will, I will spend time with you on that because I, right. I, I've done but this enough, not engineer so I think that's right. Um, on, on expert review, Possibly what we need is a small amount more formalism. Maybe an expert review ends with some token, just the URI is good enough, on a tool. And that token can be included in the draft, which is IANA's indication that expert review has already been done. We're, we're working on that. Barbara Stark. So while we're on the topic of expert review, but coming at it from the other side of things, you know, you and I have traded emails where I actually try and come from broadband forum and try to get IANA stuff. And it takes forever. You know, fortunately, I know that it's going to take forever. So I start several months in advance. So when it takes a month and a half to finally get an expert review, but I'm wondering, have, has there been any progress on what all has to trigger an expert review? Because we discussed, you know, if I just want to change the URL that my registered item is pointing to, if it says this is, you know, this registry requires expert review, then changing the URL requires expert review. And if that expert is going to take four weeks to take a look at that new URL, then it's four weeks to change a URL. 
and and I don't know if there's been any progress on trying to maybe get when people say we're creating a new registry and it requires expert review, can there be some limiting of, you know, maybe these things, if they're changed, don't require expert review or things like that? I think that's perfectly acceptable acceptable to put in as instructions to the expert. I I don't see we don't see any problem with that. I don't don't think the ISG would either. So yeah, I mean it's definitely something to think about when creating new registries and what registration procedures to use. Um, that's really, of course, up to you all and your working groups of what you want to choose. Unfortunately, with the requests that you've experienced, um, we, we've we had an issue with getting fast response rates and we're continuing to work through it. Um, and we've had actually some additional meetings to try to see if we can improve the template to ask the right questions. So we're constantly uh, trying to think about how we can make things easier, better, improve the, doc the improve the information when we originally get it. So there's less back and forth with experts. It's, it's something we constantly wanna know what we can do to make it better. Um, and in time, because we have a couple more things there, um, any feedback you guys have, you can send it directly to me, you can send it to Iana at iana.org or on the working group chairs list if you wanna start a discussion on anything, come visit us at the table. Um, we love to get feedback. We're trying to find some common themes um, from the working group chairs to, uh, I mean, help your lives pretty much, which ultimately will help us. So thank you for the feedback. We really do appreciate it. Thanks, Michelle. All right, uh, meeting minute tools. So I really had just one question, which I'll ask at the end. Um, but I wanted to seed the question with some discussion around meeting minutes and talk about, well, maybe some of the reasons why we have meeting minutes. And I've tried to put, imagine some, but I'm sure there are more that you can think of as to why we do take meeting minutes. Uh, the, the how is the a little bit of a problematic part in the sense that we have to find someone willing to take those minutes. Um, I know we have Etherpad. I mean, we have the convenience of people converging on a way to collect minutes, but um, our experience has generally shown that you know, it's uh, at the best, at best, those minutes come out a little scrappy. They're good, uh, they're good enough for maybe the immediate purpose, but really, if I want to coherently understand what actually happened, I might have to actually go to some tools. Um, and the tools are what IDEA provides, the audio stream, the meet echo recordings. And he, there was even a suggestion of some apps that have been developed for meeting minutes. Uh, so maybe we should be using those. So by virtue of the fact that, um, oh, so some BCPs, and this is just a view of uh, me and my co-chair that we tend to land up usually using the minutes that were taken in the minutes as so-called temporary minutes. We need to have something in place. So we take whatever we gather in the meeting. <coughs> uh, and we have had at least one occasion where the audio stream went down and we actually didn't have a part of the recording. So it was good to have some minutes, but really at the end of the, effort, what happens is we go back into and listen to the stream and um, use some transcribing tool to get the output of the minutes and then edit it and make it generally available as the meeting minutes. So um, by virtue of the fact that I get to ask the question, I, is, uh, I don't have to get give you any answers for the question really is, can we replace taking meeting minutes with the tools that we already have in place and maybe use some of the transcribing and editing capability that might have to be added? No. 
uh, Colin Perkins, uh, no. Um, I, I, I find it a little concerning that people um, often just try and transcribe what, what people say in the minutes. The, the, the minutes should be recording the decisions rather than just uh, summarizing what everyone says. I'm try, trying to you know, record what was said. Alyssa Cooper, just a data point for the um, for the plenary. We tried to do an automatic transcript a couple of meetings ago. We had the the secretariat um, uh, generate it and take a look at it, and their conclusion was that the amount of time it uh, took to correct the automatically generated transcript and turn it into language that could be understood by somebody who hadn't attended the plenary or watched the video was essentially equivalent to the amount of time it took for them to just take the notes from watching the video. So we decided not to do that. I think I think there's some special challenges also because we have, um, you know, people, we like, we like sometimes to have, uh, you know, people's names as you're taking the minutes, um, attribution, we use a lot of acronyms, um, people with very different accents from um, all around the world. And I think some of the tools as, as good as they've gotten still struggle with, um, with those aspects. So we found that it was easier to just have somebody take the minutes. So for me, I actually find it useful to have at the very least a sequence of who spoke and in what order, so then when I bring up the video stream, I can kind of find that place in the video stream by comparing it against the minutes, and then I can listen to exactly what they said, but you know, if there's a brief summary of kind of the topic of what they're saying, that's just really helpful to me in finding the place so that I can really hear the discussion, which is why I do more than just summarize, I mean, like at the high level summarize, but actually at the person to person summarize. Um, yeah, I have found in watching some of these auto things that it is really hilarious um, <laughs> what they do. And the other thing I wanted to mention is, you know, we've had some times where power has gone out and things like that, and there has been no recording of sure. what happened. And it's really useful to have the minute taker in place before that happens. <laughs> yeah, to follow up on um, the response to Colin, I, I tend to, when I take minutes, um, note the point that was being made by the person at the mic as best as I can compress it. Um, but I think it's worth it for folks who are not in the meeting room to read those minutes and see those points just to make sure that things that they wanted to be covered were or were not covered and can reply to the list. Mm -hmm. um, I, it would be lovely if we could pull this off, but I don't think we can and end up with something useful in the end. Yeah. Hey, the decision is nearly worthless uh, if you don't know the reasons for it. Uh, it will be, it will be uh, retaken. So we, we have to have uh, that information. Um, I originally came up here to, to uh, express my, my unhappiness that Etherpad cr crashed four times during our morning meeting. Um, but um, uh, really the, the one thing that uh, may be useful to you, um, if you look at the YouTube uh, recordings, there is a well hidden button, get transcript. So if, if you if you enjoy the hilariousness, you know where to get it. Um, I, I, you almost took all the wind out of my sails. I'll give you an example. Suppose all you record is the decisions made, and the only decision is made is we made no decision. Let's take this back to the list. If you don't have all those points recorded somewhere, you're just going to repeat the discussion on the list. So okay. it, it's really important to have at least the summaries Pete was talking about. All right. So we have four minutes. So let's talk fast. Hi, Jim Fenton. I think one of the things this is pointing out is there's a lot of uncertainty, uh, uh, particularly by the minute takers, about the level of granularity that they should include. And we need to have some guidelines somewhere, and we need to have them somewhere that, or maybe I just haven't found them yet, but um, so, somewhere that when we ask for a volunteer at a meeting, they know what level of 
stuff to to write in the in the notes because I mean, we're often asking on the fly for a note taker and somebody says well i'll help but we don't tell them what to do and, and then also if nobody volunteers we say all you have to do is record the actions to lessen the job um okay so <laughs> We, we, we can maybe identify some what, what we consider a good set, couple of good sets of minutes and point to these as examples. Oh, that's true. Dave Baltimore, I thought that just came to me was, you know, if there's a very short set of things that we could recommend to the note takers, we might be able to post them in the boilerplate that, that comes with the Etherpad when you first load it up. Okay. Okay, so uh, the last... Uh, uh, thing besides open mic, which we are not going to get to today, is uh, next steps for edu activities. Um, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about what edu activities currently are and what we might do with them. I think the really short thing that I want to um, get to all of you on is we're still working on getting it fixed on the the slides, but on the data tracker. But edu team is now an open mailing list, and anybody that wants to join the edu team is welcome to do so. And over the course of the next three or four months, uh, we'll be, uh, we're, we're basically going to keep what we're doing for the next three to four months. And then in that time frame, we're going to think about what do we really need from an edu team and how we really want to construct it. And I'd really encourage you all. Um, a lot of the things we talked about today, it would be great if we had a little bit better um, materials for the working group chairs. Um, and, you know, there might be an opportunity to have some professionally developed resources. What would those resources need to be? Uh, so I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, and uh, I would strongly encourage people that are interested in this space to join the edu team uh, and not edu discuss, edu team. And we'll get all that fixed eventually. <laughs> so uh, with that, um, it's 11, it's 114. So I think we're going to skip the open mic and take all of that to the mailing list. Thank you all.